Okay, so welcome to Edible Flowers, everyone. This is a salad that is, is in the picture behind me that Carrie put together. Isn't that just a feast for the eyes to enjoy? And, and speaking of um, feast for the eyes, as we do this presentation, uh, you need to use your imagination with us because when we do this presentation in person, we have some samples, we have some things for you to smell, some things for you to taste. So try to go into that memory of tastes uh, and smells from your garden to try to imagine kind of some of the things we're talking about today. So Carrie and I are Marin Master Gardeners, uh, trained volunteers who share their knowledge with the public. We are non-paid members, darn it, of, just kidding, of the UC uh, um, Cooperative Extension. And um, we have our help desk uh, that folks can access about anything that's happening in Marin County in their gardens. Okay, so the use of flowers as food dates back to as far as we have data on, on what we eat. You know, there's uh, um, uh, information about roots and, and leaves and, and of course flowers too. The thing about flowers is that they look so gorgeous. They're very tempting, of course, to our pollinator friends as well as to our eyes. Um, they're in many, many types of cooking, European, Asian, East Indian, early American settlers, and today there's a renewed interest in um, edible flowers as far as infusing their fragrance, their nutrition, their taste, their color, uh, and so forth. Just gorgeous. Take it away, Carrie. Yeah. So we're going to talk about four different groups of edible flowers today. Uh, we're going to talk about herbs, fruit and vegetable flowers, ornamental flowers, and also surprisingly enough weeds. There are definitely weed flowers out there um, that are edible that people use for cooking. Um, we'll talk about the flower family, uh, the effort to grow them. Most of these are very easy. The flavor and actually how to use them as well. Some ideas for cooking. So some basic do's and don'ts. Uh, only eat flowers if you know for certain they're edible. Um, oftentimes it's very difficult to tell, um, so make sure you do your research before you try them out. Make sure you wash everything before you eat it, just in case. Um, there could be pesticides, there could be herbicides. Um, make sure they're completely clean and dry first. Uh, stick with the flower petals, especially if you have any type of allergy or if you're not sure. Um, remove the stamens and the pistils and use the petals right after you take them apart so they don't wilt. Um, and also start small. Do one species at a time. Don't combine a bunch of things. Limit your quantities. Um, you don't want to upset your digestive system. And if you don't know if you have allergies or not, you certainly don't want to spark it um, with overdoing it. Uh, don't eat flowers that you pick on the roadside. You just don't know uh, what could be on there. There could be herbicides, pesticides again. Um, so you definitely want to stay away from those. Don't eat flowers that you buy from nurseries or the florist. Um, again, um, they'll use pesticides on those oftentimes, and you don't want to ingest those. Uh, don't assume that flowers that you're served at a restaurant are edible. If you have questions, ask. Um, they may be just used as a garnish and with the intention not to eat them. Uh, actually, in California, it's illegal to put garnishes on a plate that are not ed edible. Uh, but again, if you're not sure, make sure and ask. <laughs> you don't want that to happen. <laughs> So we'll start out with herbs. Um, there are a lot of different herbs that people grow, especially here in Marin, and a lot of them do produce edible flowers. So we'll focus on some that are really common, that are really easy to grow, and that give you a really good pop of flavor. Uh, we'll go through chives, basil, lavender, sage, thyme, fennel, borage, and safflower. So chives, chives are in the allium family. They're very, very easy to grow. Um, you can actually get regular chives, and they also have garlic chives. So there are several different varieties you can try. The flavor is actually a mild onion or garlic flavor. Um, the flowers are very powerful. So if you've used your chives and you've kind of chopped them up and you use them um, in your cooking, the flowers are at least double that. So you have to be a little bit cautious when you first eat them, 
especially the seed heads when they first start out you know they're really tiny you can see here from the photograph those are the seed heads before they blossom out and those are very powerful um, all parts of the plant are edible um, you can garnish a salad with the blossoms it's actually really pretty they're really pretty kind of purplish pink color you can use them in soups you can sprinkle them on baked potatoes um, you can mix them into goat cheese and honey um, and put them on scrambled eggs there's a lot of different ways to use the flowers and again I would start just by picking off the petals and trying them one at a time instead of popping that whole uh, flower in your mouth because it is quite overwhelming. Uh, basil again really common herb that we grow here in Marin. Um, it's very easy to grow. It's typically an annual. Uh, there are uh, some that are not annuals, African blue for example, um, but they are quite sensitive to cold. So depending on the type, the flowers can be white uh, purple or pink, and they are a little bit milder taste than the leaves, than the basil leaves. Um, can be slightly bitter, um, and it also has quite a delicate flavor as well. You can use the flowers, sprinkle them over pasta, over salads, um, anywhere you want a nice pop of color and flavor. You can infuse the flowers in olive oil um, and use them as a garnish for stone fruit and pesto, ice cream, um, sprinkle them on tomatoes. That's a really common combination. Um, people also use the flowers as a tea or even as an herbal vinegar. So lots of different ways you can use those flowers. Mm -hmm. when, I, when, when we stop screen sharing, you can see I have some basil flowers here. And like Carrie was saying, the, um, the basil flowers are, so, are delicate. Certain flower, uh, flowers are more pungent and certain ones are more delicate. So um, it's nice to put basil flower petals on something sweet so it's not too powerful of an herb flavor. Yeah. Here's, a con here's actually an example of uh, some of the different flower uh, basils and the flowers. They look very different. Um, as you can see, the one on the left is a little bit more purpley pink and then we have our standard white on the right. And there it is on a burger. <laughs> 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 Yum. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> uh, lavender, another really common um, herb that we grow here in Marin. Um, it's very easy. It does best in very dry, well-drained soil. Uh, sandy soils are best for, for lavender, um, and they really want full sun. They're native to the old world, uh, but they're found everywhere now. Um, the flavor of the flower, if you guys have ever tried it, it's very floral, kind of sweet a little bit of a lemon and citrus note on there. Uh, it's great to use in stews. You can reduce sauces and use it. Grilled lamb, herbed goat cheese actually is one of my favorite. Um, you can mix it in when the goat cheese is a little bit soft and you get a really pretty purple color uh, when you use it. Um, glass of champagne, sprinkling them in the top there. Uh, really pretty again on chocolate cake. You get that, that contrasting color and also as a garnish on ice cream. Uh, you can also candy them and make lavender sugar, which is something that they do sell at the farmer's market on occasion. Uh, it's actually really good. Um, one note on lavender is don't consume the lavender oil unless you know for certain that it's not been sprayed. Again, you want to stay away from those uh, pesticides. And there's a beautiful lavender field. Sage, another real common uh, herb that we grow here in Marin. Uh, very easy. It's native to the Mediterranean. It has a soft, fragrant aroma and a very sweet, savory flavor. Uh, the flowers are more subtle than the leaves, which is actually really common for most of these herbs. Um, you can use them as a garnish. You can put them in salads, mix them with beans and corn dishes on pork, stuffed mushrooms uh, in a pesto sauce. The flowers are either violet, pink, or white. Um, and for tea, people pour hot water over the flowers and you get a really nice um, herbally sage tea. Uh, you can also use the leaves and make an herbed vinegar and stir them into yellow cake batter, which is actually another really pretty pop of color and um, gives you a little bit of an unexpected taste. And you can also dry them and, and use them later. They dry very well. Thyme um, is, loves hot, sunny locations, again, with well-drained soil. Uh, it's very drought tolerant, um, really easy to put in a container, uh, use for cooking. 
the flowers, the flavor is very floral and savory. And uh, the aroma has a bit of mint undertone. It's a, again, a milder version of the leaf. These leaves, flowers are really, really, really tiny. So um, there's something, there's a thing called a her herb stripper and you can run it through the herb stripper and get a lot of those petals off. Otherwise you're spending a lot of time kind of picking at them and they're very tiny. Um, when the plant begins to produce pink and purple flowers, both the flowers and the leaves are edible. The flowers can be pink, purple, or white. You can sprinkle them on soup and salad, use them in a vinaigrette, use an herb butter, uh, which is again really pretty, and also use the sprigs as a garnish. Fennel uh, may be a little bit less common for people to grow, but it's a very hardy uh, perennial. It likes dry soils, which most of these do, um, and temperate climate indigenous to the shores of the Med, and now it's naturalized widely. You can find it everywhere. It has a mild anise flavor. Um, the starburst yellow flowers can be used in desserts, in cold soups, and garnish uh, with an entree. The one thing to know about fennel is that poison hemlock looks very, very similar to fennel. So they're in the same family. Um, the poison hemlock typically has red blotches on the stem, but that's not always the case. So really make sure uh, that you know what you're doing. Don't go collect wild herbs unless you really know um, and you can really identify which one's which. Borage is native to the med. The blossoms have a slightly sweet cucumber taste. They're actually really quite different um, than you would expect. The, they're kind of a violet blue, really pretty color. They're great with sorbets and savory dishes. You can sprinkle them in lemonade. Uh, gin and tonics. Uh, chilled soups and dips. And you can also freeze them in ice cubes. Um, Janine does this and it's a really, really pretty look when you pop them in a drink. Um, so either for desserts or cocktails, it's a really unexpected way uh, to add a little bit of your edible garden into your drinks. Safflower again is a little bit more unusual. Um, it does best in areas with very warm temperatures and sunny dry conditions like most of our herbs. It has a mild, earthy, subtle flavor. Uh, the dried flowers come in yellow, orange, and red, and they're actually used as coloring and flavoring for foods instead of uh, saffron, which is more expensive um, and more potent. So safflower is very common, commonly used for food coloring. And there's another picture of it. Okay, so before we kind of talk about this big thing, um, what does it mean uh, to be edible anyway? And if we were in a classroom setting, I would be calling on you. <laughs> so um, don't all speak at once. No, just play. Okay, so. Uh, it has to satisfy two things if to, for something to be edible. The first is, is it toxic or poisonous in any way? It would not be considered edible if it was. The second thing is, does it provide any nutrition? So you can eat a pebble. It's not going to be toxic at all, but it's not going to give you any nutrition. So those are the two things uh, to keep in mind when we think about uh, things that are edible. And so as I was kind of searching on the internet to get things to supplement this presentation. I was looking up um, man eating a, a flower. And so I got a man eating flower, which is what this big thing is. Can you all see my cursor? You yeah. can see my cursor. Okay, great. Um, and this is actually a real thing. And then of course I've got some, um, fly eaters, or I can't remember, a, a Venus fly trap. Yeah, that's what these are here. Um, and so that looks not exactly what I was searching for. And then I got a, a picture of this fellow. Um, uh, and then this came up. So here's a big flower eating some spectators. And then of course, here's, this is, this is she is also a man eater. And, um, but then finally, this is what happens. This is what happens when I'm sitting here, it's like 10 o'clock at night and I'm surfing the net. <laughs> okay, and then I finally get down to business. Um, so edible vegetables. Um, 
So here, so here's a question about a general rule. Is it acceptable to eat the flowers of the produce that comes from that plant? Is that an acceptable rule to make, do you all think? Yes, yeah. Um, ex okay, so yes, it's absolutely an acceptable uh, assumption. However, just like everything, there are exceptions to the rule. So we, we can see here's broccoli, that's a flower head. Um, cauliflower, that's a flower head. And what's this? This is a tomato flower. And so what about tomato flowers? It's a big no. So tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, um, and that's, uh, I'm naming things in the what family? Solanaceae family. And also asparagus. Asparagus flowers are also a no. So general rule is yes, but there are always exceptions. Okay. So, um, Let's start with probably one of the most popular flowers to eat, and that's the squash and or pumpkin flower. Um, very easy to grow. Um, by the end of the season, my son doesn't even want to look at another zucchini. We've had so many zucchini. Um, and so one of the ways to cut that down is to take some of the blossoms initially. Um, they're a lovely flavor. Lots can be done with them. You wash them, trim them, remove the stamens, and then you can stuff them with cheese. You can deep fry them. Um, uh, the possibilities are endless. Um, so you can see here in this picture, there are zucchini squash coming out of the base of the plant, and then there are flowers that are coming off stalks. So the ones that are coming off stalks are the male flowers. Those are the ones you want to take if you're concerned at all with um, cutting down on your yield. So take, take them in and um, enjoy those with your dinner early on uh, in the spring. Okay, artichoke, one of my favorite plants in the garden because it's a big plant, that um, a showy plant that, that takes up a lot of space and, and gives you these highly nutritious flowers uh, to eat if you choose to. The Asteraceae family, it's an easy perennial mild and sweet. So you want to take them when they're relatively young. Um, uh, let's see, where's my... Okay. So um, one of the things that I've noticed is when I cut off the artichoke, um, black sooty mold is sometimes a problem that, that I get. In addition to pincher bugs, they kind of congregate inside the the flower head. So I'll kind of bang it on the deck a little bit, get all the little creatures out, bring it inside. Now the bud is really um, a, a, it's a bunch of small flowers um, together with some bracts at the base. Does anybody know what all those little flowers are called to, when they're together like that? It's called an inflorescence. And um, once that bud blooms, the structure changes and it's barely edible. So, of course, they need to be taken when they're um, young. And interestingly, the total antioxidant capacity of an artichoke head is one of the highest reported for vegetables. Um, and it contains a chemical called cinerine, which is in the leaves. You know, you take the leaves and you run it across your bottom teeth or your top teeth or however you uh, choose to do it. Um, and that chemical cinerine inhibits your taste buds a little bit. And so if you take a bite from an artichoke leaf and then you take a sip of water, the water will taste sweet. I've noticed this, this actually, i uh, experienced this. So try it the next time you uh, have an artichoke. Easy to grow, daisy family. So vegetable plow, uh, flowers, lots and lots, uh, lots of, to choose from. If you're like me, you're arugula, has gone to seed many times. Um, sometimes your broccoli, uh, your brassicaceae, family uh, beans and peas, okra, we'll talk a little bit about those, um, um, are all um, options to try. So walk out into your garden, pick this, pick that, experiment. And that's what um, probably one of the goals of this presentation today is just to go out there and try things that you wouldn't normally try. Okay, so this is a hibiscus flower. 
Um, when it, I went to a restaurant um, the other day. I'm not going to mention what it is. But anyway, it's a, um, a Mexican restaurant, and I got a cocktail with hibiscus syrup in it. I know it's hard to believe I'm over 21, but, but I got this um, uh, cocktail, and it was delicious. It was sweet, but different with some tangy raspberry notes, but not altogether exactly the same. So it was really quite a treat. So there's a, um, a semi-sweet syrup that's all the rage, this hibiscus syrup. And I think it's called, um, well, no, 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 no. The flowers are just uh, what they are. But there's a dry, if you dry the hibiscus flowers, they're called flor de jamaica. I think I'm, I think I'm saying that correctly. But it's very popular in a tea, has a tart raspberry flavor. So if you see that as an option anywhere, give it a try. Okay, so here's some amaranth and quinoa. Before these um, are ready to give their uh, ancient grains, um, you can try the flowers. They're nutty and um, not as fibrous as the grains. Such a pretty thing to have in the garden also. Okay, so these are pea, I believe this is an arugula flower. And you know, arugula is sharp tasting anyway, so the flowers are also going to be sharp tasting. It's a lovely thing to add to your salads. Here's a pea blossom from a pea, uh, from a plant in the legume family. So here, which, which all are edible, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the whole thing. So here are some sweet peas in the lower right corner. Are those edible? Does anyone think? That's a big no. So don't confuse pea blossoms with sweet pea blossoms because those are not edible. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about fruit. Um, this is a real treat and we don't normally um, we don't normally take our fruit blossoms because they are a little more painful, I think, to take off the, the plant because that's where our delicious fruit is going to come from. Um, but one of the um, surprises uh, in the garden is when Carrie and I sampled a bunch of fruit blossoms and found the little bursts of flavor that will hit your tongue and then go away. It was just such a treat. So, um, so I encourage you to go out and try. So lots of different varieties, delicate and sweet. So here we have blueberry blossoms. When, when we ate our blueberry blossoms, it was a little tiny blueberry flavor and then it was gone. And the mm -hmm. same was with strawberries, a little tiny, and this is an alpine strawberry here in the middle and this is an apple blossom up at the top. Again, little flavor and then it goes away. Um, the thing about apple blossoms, uh, let me go back. Think about apple blossoms, just like apple seeds, there are cyanide cursors in there. You know, they say uh, apple uh, seeds have a teeny bit of uh, teeny bit poisonous. Of course, you'd need to eat a ton in order to get any type of um, uh, discomfort, I think. But still, something to be aware of. Okay, so up here in the upper... Uh, upper left is a pineapple guava blossom. If anybody's lucky enough to have a pineapple guava tree, you'll know how easy it is to use. The fruit is just delicious and the bloom is gorgeous and it's very sweet and tropical tasting. Just a lovely thing to experiment with. Um, pretty easy to grow, drought tolerant. We've got um, a master gardener friend who lives in Nevada who can't speak highly enough about her pineapple guava tree. Okay, and to the right of that, these are elderberry blossoms. Um, the cre they, have a, they have a sweet scent and taste. Now, there's a lot of medicinal use uh, with respect to elderberry trees, the root, um, the bark, the leaves, the stems, that kind of thing. And they can uh, cause nausea and diarrhea and that kind of stuff if you're eating those... Um, in kind of um, old time remedies or something like that. But the blooms you, um, are very sweet and delicate tasting. This is one of the blooms that if you're comfortable with where you're getting it, um, you wouldn't necessarily want to wash because all the flavor uh, gets washed away if you wash it first. So if it's in your backyard and, and not covered with ash, 
um, then uh, it might be nice to try. Um, and he, right here below it are the elderberries, and of course we've all heard of elderberry wine. Now in the lower um, left corner, these are banana blossoms. Of course they don't grow around here, but I wanted to profile them because they're a really lovely thing to try in, um, in any uh, South, Southeast Asian cooking. It's a real treat, of course, very sweet and reminiscent of bananas. Okay, so here's another picture of some apple blossoms up at the top. And here's one of the biggest surprises and treats when it comes to fruit blossoms. This picture on the left is lime blossoms and this one on uh, the right is lemon. These thick waxy petals are bursting, absolutely bursting with flavor. Carrie makes a key lime pie and she'll sprinkle some lime blossoms over the top, but not too many because they are just a burst of flavor. Uh, my lemon tree is blooming right now. It has a few blooms. If you have any kind of sister's tree, go outside, try one of the blossoms. You'll be, uh, you'll be surprised. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so uh, here's some weed flowers that we're going to talk about. Um, most people probably have some sort of a weed flower in their garden and you don't ever think that you might be able to eat it. So don't pull them yet. Um, figure out first if you want to give them a try and there's lots of ways to use them. Okay, since, uh, since we're doing this on Zoom, we're not doing this live. We typically do the name the weed game and uh, we'll put a uh, Put a picture up and people try to guess what they think the weed is. Um, in this case we'll just go through them and you guys can guess to yourselves and see if you're right. So this is pretty common, dandelion. Believe it or not, dandelions are actually edible. Um, they're a familiar lawn weed. Um, they have a mildly bittersweet flavor. The flowers are crunchy. You can eat them raw or you can actually fry them. Um, the dandelion was actually brought to the U.S. by European settlers and they introduced it as a salad green. So that was the original intent of the dandelion flower and how it ended up here. And they have more beta carotene than carrots do. So they're also very healthy for you. Okay, can anybody guess what this is? And the answer is? A chickweed flower, uh, maybe not as common as the dandelion flower, but they're definitely out there. You can eat them raw or cooked. Um, it has a very delicate spinach-like flavor, um, kind of surprising. You wouldn't expect it just by looking at it. The next one, probably pretty oh, common. Right. You guys might recognize that, and it is the clover. So it's a clover flower. Um, it's also very common, in, common in your lawn. Uh, flowers are both red and white, and you can eat them raw or cooked. Um, some people actually dry them for tea, and you can have a dandelion tea. So before you pull them out, think about creative ways that you may be able to use it. And clover is also a very important food for bumblebees uh, and honeybees. They, they both go for the, the clover flower. You can use the leaves and the flower itself. Anybody know? Mm -hmm. Sorrel. Uh, Sorrel is another really common weed. Um, uh, a lot of people find this to be very invasive. And once you get it in your garden, sometimes it can be hard to get rid of. Um, but all sorrels are edible. They're very rich in vitamin C. Uh, you can eat them raw in salads or you can cook them like a green. And the seed pods are very lemony and it's very refreshing. So before you get really mad at your sorrel and yank it all out, uh, try getting creative with it and cooking with it. It'll be very surprising. Anybody guess? Chicory flower, also considered a weed, um, but the flowers, the buds, the leaves, and the roots are all edible. Um, the blooms and the young leaves you can use for salad. Uh, you can actually take the root and dry them and roast them. And you guys may have heard of chicory coffee. 
um, that you can add this to your coffee and get a nice little trickery pot. Okay. Now we'll, we'll um, kind of bring it home with talking about some ornamental flowers. Um, and to my delight, um, Carrie has a little um, demonstration tutorial to, to share with us. Um, so there's no better way to make your plate look gorgeous than to take some ornamental flowers and to decorate it. Um, what we have here on the left are some violet sugared um, petals on the top of these um, truffles or whatever. And then, um, of course, um, some roses, which we're going to get right to, um, being one of the most popular and most showy edible flowers. So the family rose ACA, um, so easy to grow. We're lucky to be in an area where lots of people have roses. Initial water needs uh, are medium, but ongoing, they're really quite uh, tolerant um, of a dry climate. So the flavor depends on the soil, the type, and the color. Generally, uh, the darker in color, the more pungent uh, the flavor. So um, all roses are edible, with the flavor being, like I said, more pronounced in the darker varieties. The miniature varieties are great for ice cream and desserts and the larger petals. Um, one of our favorite things to do, Carrie's going to show you in just a moment. Um, uh, petals can be freezed in ice cubes, put in punch, all that stuff, uh, jellies. One of the things I grew up with was um, dessert, Middle Eastern desserts that were flavored with rose water. Um, so uh, um, the one thing to note, though, is that the flavor gets more bitter as you go down, uh, down the petal closer to where it connects to the bud. So sometimes I'll take away that white bit, that white bitter bit that uh, is where the petal connects to the flower. Take that off, and then you've got the sweeter outer petal uh, to, to eat after that. So... Um, like I said, one of our favorite things are these sugared flower petals and take it away, Carrie. Okay. So I did a few of them this morning just so you guys can see what they look like when they're finished. And then I'll do a quick example um, so you can see. So if I stop share, okay, I think I stopped sharing, yeah? Okay, and yeah. So here's, here's what they look like. Um, once they're finished, they get sort of crispy uh, like a little potato chip. So that's one that was done this morning and it's dried out now. Um, so you can use these on, like Janine said, almost anything, but this is what they look like. Here's one that hasn't been done yet and I'll show you what you can do uh, to make your own. It's a very easy process, although it does take a little bit of time. What you wanna do is take your rose petal off of your rose um, if you don't use pesticides, that's great. Um, it's good to kind of wash them off a little bit first so they're nice and clean. And you take an egg white, and just so you know, these are not cooked, so just to be aware of that. Take a little paintbrush, and you sort of just go ahead and put this on both sides of your petal, a little bit of the egg white, and then you just dredge it through some sugar. You can use uh, baker sugar is really fine and thin, and it sticks a little bit better. You just go ahead and put it through your sugar and go ahead and stick it on a piece of parchment paper on a plate and let it dry. And it typically takes at least a half a day to dry. Um, you can pop them in the oven for a little bit and crisp them up or stick them in the sun. Uh, it'll dry a little bit more quickly. But this is what it looks like when it's uh, nice and wet. And again, it will crisp up into more of a potato chip like this. And it's nice and crispy and it has a really lovely rose flavor to it. Um, again, these, I did not take the bitter part off, which is right down here at the bottom. You can just cut that off so you don't need to eat that. Um, but this is just for demonstration purposes. So there you go. Very simple to do. And I have to tell you, it was so cute. We've done this uh, presentation a couple times and we bring samples of those rose petals to the presentation. And, um, and there, was, there, were, there was a woman who came to both presentations because she wanted more rose petals. So it was a, it was a, popular, <laughs> it was a popular bit. Yeah. 
Okay, let me go back to sharing. Um, let's see. Where was I? Sorry to mess you up. <laughs> oh, no, that's, oh, there we go. Okay, okay. Sorry. No, that was great. Beautiful. Question? Oh, okay, yes. Um, can you just put the, the uh, rose petal in ice cubes? I mean, you know, to make ice cubes. Do you need to put sugar on them or can you just put just plain petal in the ice cube? In other words, you freeze the petal in the ice cube. Right. I think you could do both, but it might be simpler just to... Um... Yeah, you might not do it with the sugar, right, Carrie? I think you just I put plain not, ice. Yeah, cream. right. Without. Yeah, I was just thinking I don't want to have sugar stuff. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you get sweet. You get the, the sweetness of the, and you can just water. Just set it in water mm -hmm, and for sure. take out the white part, mm -hmm. the, the attached. Yes, absolutely. Great. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. Um, and here we are with probably one of the most popular edible flowers, nasturtium, because they're so easy to grow. They reseed so easily. Um, the flavor is sweet and spicy. It's a wonderful thing to add to salads, uh, more of a uh, savory um, addition. Um, so, you know, you can garnish, platter, salad, put with cheese, put on sandwiches. Uh, you know, your, your options are endless. Um, and what some people also do uh, is they will pickle the seeds and use them like capers, which is kind of, which is kind of fun. Um, here's a question I forgot to ask you all earlier. Um, well, I'll just tell you that capers are an unopened flower bud of a plant. And I'm not sure if anybody knew that or not, but that's a fly. Anytime you have capers, you're eating a flower. Okay, so pansies, just so lovely. They take a little more uh, work. So Johnny Jump Ups, Violets, Pansies, all those. Um, they take a little time to mature. You have to start them indoors if you, uh, 10 to 12 weeks maybe, and they like uh, well draining lots of water. However, they're a real treat if you have a climate that is amenable to, to growing these. Um, they have a slightly green grassy flavor. Um, if you only eat the petals, it's very, very mild. But if you eat the whole, the whole flower, um, it's very wintry tasting and green overtones. Um, you can use them as a, as a garnish. You can use them as dessert. All sorts of, of fun things. Um, so that's, that's a lovely, uh, beautiful flower to consider using. Marigolds are edible. Um, you know... I've, I've always had lots of marigolds in the garden. Um, there's the, the, the thing that says that they kind of keep some bugs away and you plant them around in your garden. Um, unfortunately, I've never found that to work very well, but I'm, I won't give up hope. <laughs> and the Asteraceae family, easy to grow. Citrusy flavors, sometimes people use them as a substitute for saffron and in salads. Really just kind of a nice... Uh, nice color uh, and citrusy. Okay, tulips in the Liliaceae family. Um, the one thing about tulips is that they need a lot of water and support. However, there's nothing more gorgeous than a tulip cup that's held together by a little um, delicate string and have dessert moosed into the base of the flower. It's just the, one of the most spectacular desserts I've ever had. Um, and it has a nice mild flavor, so it can really uh, work well with desserts. Sweet lettuce, baby peas, cucumber-like flavors. And then of course the leaves can be used as a garnish. Um, one of the flower, n not everybody does this of course, but I sometimes would confuse tulips with irises mm -hmm. and irises are absolutely not edible. So <laughs> in case anybody um, thought they were the same like me, <laughs> then don't, don't eat them. Okay. 
So again, just a color bonanza when it comes to um, tulips and a lot of your other edible flowers. I mean, you know, I've never done this, but wouldn't it be grand to send your kid to school with a, with a tulip filled with arrows from a pomegranate? I mean, it's just over the top wonderful. Um, but uh, something to aspire to, I think. Okay. Okay. Before we end, I want to say one more thing of, a, of an edible that I didn't mention, and that is day lilies. Um, seeing this picture of these lilies to the, to the right of our thank you reminded me of the fact that day lilies have been eaten for centuries. They're not in the Liliaceae family, which is kind of um, what you might think. But, so don't confuse them with anything in the lily family. Day lilies, if you look them up, uh, people will stir fry the buds, uh, and they're just a wonderful, wonderful food. I'm going to make sure to add that into our presentation next time. Um, I have one question before you leave. Is I have allergies to all California uh, grasses, so the dandelion, chickweed, clover, sorrel, and chicory would be out for me? You know, I would be, they're not actually a grass, um, mm -hmm. but again, if you have any allergies whatsoever, I would be really cautious if you decide you're going to try it and do very tiny bits at a time and don't mix them up. Try one at a time, make sure that you feel okay with it, and then you can try a second one. Don't, don't try three or four different kinds and don't try a lot. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There was one chat question about the squash blossoms, about why you remove the stamen. I think it's just easier to, to deal with them. You don't have to, um, um, but there's lots of little pollen-y. If, if you have any kind of reaction to pollen, say, um, it, you would get a double dose if you left it in there, and so generally you would take, take it out. And it's not just the squash blossom, it's the others as well. Anything that has a stamen and pistils in it, you want to just remove those just to be safe. Less, less allergy prone. Good reason. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's a really, it's a, we'll, we'll stay on the line for, for more questions if they come up because sometimes, sometimes they percolate and then they bubble to the surface. But it's a real treat to be with you today during these um, it's nice to reach out to the public in any way we can if we can't get together personally. So thank you all so very much for coming. And um, uh, hopefully there will be lots more presentations from, from me and Carrie and from the Master Gardeners in general um, uh, reaching out to the public. So thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Okay, there's another chat question about the presentation being available. It is being recorded. And it will be on the Marin County Free Library YouTube page in about two weeks. It takes a while to get the recording and have it edited and then post it. So um, you can send me your request and I can send you the link so that you can find it more easily. And that's laldrich at marincounty.org. Thank, Thank you, Linda. Thank, Thank you, Linda. Thank you Linda. so much. I learned a lot. Thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, yeah. everybody.